Welcome, friends, to the fourth session of our Sabbath Enrichment Seminar. In the previous three sessions, I have shared with you, first of all, the story of the Sabbath in my life, how the Lord opened the door for me to enter, study, research, and publish the Sabbath of all places inside the Vatican. And then we studied together how the Sabbath enabled us to serve God, ourselves, and others. In the third presentation, you might remember, we explored how on and through the Sabbath we can experience in a special way the presence, the peace, and the rest of Christ in our life. The lecture of this afternoon is entitled, The Sabbath Under Crossfire. Incidentally, this is the very title of my latest book on the Sabbath, The Sabbath Under Crossfire. This is the study where I deal with the latest attacks against the Sabbath. And I want to thank God for using this printed page to help so many clergymen of different denominations to accept the Sabbath. You know, recently I received a letter from a Salvation Army minister. His name is Roger Davis. They refer to themselves as captain because the Salvation Army has a kind of a military structure. And I remember this uh, Roger Davis telling me that an Adventist sister gave him a copy of this book. He took it with him to Scotland on a vacation trip. And he, said, and he told me, you know, as I read your book, I became convicted about the Sabbath. When I got back from my vacation trip, I shared the Sabbath message with the congregation. It took me three months, you know, to go over the subject with my people. But now we have voted to move our services from Sunday to Saturday. Would you be willing to come to Grand Pass, Oregon, spend the Sabbath with us? You might be able to help our people to understand and experience the Sabbath more fully. Well, I said, that's exciting. Surely I'm willing to come. But I said, what about joining with our Adventist church? We have a beautiful church in Grants Pass, Oregon, a church with 7,000 members. I said, what about joining together? Would you be willing to do that? Why not? And so on that particular Sabbath, by the way, I should mention that I called the pastor of the Adventist church, Marvin Clark. I said, Pastor Clark, I have an invitation from the Salvation Army in Grand Pass. They have accepted the Sabbath, and they would like me to spend the Sabbath with them, and I suggested the possibility of joining together. What do you think about it? Oh, that's a great idea. When can you come? May the 11th was my opening, and on that Sabbath, mamma mia, we had a great rally. 700 Adventists, 120 Salvation Army, and it was a marvelous experience for our people to interact with Christian friends of other faith. You know, sometimes we are a bit isolated, you know. We feel that we are the only one that have the truth. And so to speak, uh, you know, we don't always make an effort to build bridges with Christians of other faith. And it was a marvelous experience. I gave an opportunity to, um, to Pastor Roger Davis to share his own testimony on Sabbath afternoon and how he discovered the Sabbath and what difference has the uh, celebration of the Sabbath made to his own personal spiritual life and to his congregation. And now I am told that a good number of those who visited our church on that day are also receiving Bible study and becoming better acquainted with our church and with our message. So this uh, book that I have written has been used by the Lord in a very providential way. Now, by way of introduction, may I remind all of us that the Sabbath has been under the constant crossfire of controversy. Would you believe it? Since the time of the Reformation, over 3,000 treaties have been written on the Sabbath Sunday question. Um, if you were to go to the library, to James White Library, you will find that we have 1,021 titles of, you know, of books and treaties and articles uh, discussing the Sabbath Sunday question. Truly, we can say that the Sabbath has had no rest. There has been no rest for the Sabbath. The question is, why is the Sabbath so controversial? Have you ever stopped to think, why is it that of all the Ten Commandments, only the Fourth Commandment, the Sabbath Commandment, has been disputed, has been challenged, has been rejected? I am not aware of doctoral dissertation disputing the other nine commandments. It's only the Sabbath Commandment that proves to be so controversial. What do you think is the reason? Eh? Any idea? While you think, perhaps I can share you my idea. I think that one of the major reasons is that the Sabbath summons us 
to consecrate our time to God. And you know what? People are very touched about their time. Isn't it true? People want to use their time to seek for pleasure, to seek for profit, and not necessarily to seek for the peace and the presence of God in our life. In other words, we live today in a very self-centered society. Isn't it true? And the Sabbath challenge us to be God-centered, not only on the seventh-day Sabbath, but through the seventh-day Sabbath every day of the week. And may I say right away at the very uh, beginning of our lecture this afternoon that this is why I believe that the Sabbath is going to become such a testing truth, such a controversial truth in this final hour of world history. Because people worship pleasure, worship, you know, the, the, their, uh, uh, the, their uh, desires rather than seeking to give priority to God. Now, what I'd like to do this afternoon, I would like to discuss with you two significant developments. First of all, we want to look to the various attacks against the Sabbath today. And this is going to take us about an hour. This will be a, a, a survey of the latest attacks against the Sabbath. And then in the second part, we are going to uh, consider the rediscovery of the Sabbath. You will be thrilled to see how the Sabbath is being rediscovered in an unprecedented way today by scholars, church leaders, and religious organizations. But before beginning my formal lecture, for the sake of those who could not hear my first uh, presentation, my testimony, I thought I would take just a few moments to share with you the reason for my passionate interest for the Sabbath. You may be wondering, Brother Sam, why did you spend so many years of your life writing, you know, four major books on the Sabbath? Why do you travel around the world, you know, proclaiming, sharing the Sabbath message? Well, the reason is simple. The Sabbath was a testing truth in my life. I had to suffer ridicule, rejection, persecution for honoring the Savior on the Sabbath. You see, I was born in the city of Rome. Uh, in the first lecture, I showed you my birthplace, right opposite to the entrance to the Vatican Museum. I, sp I spent the first 18 years of my life living under the shadow of the Vatican, and I had many problems to face. I had problems for missing school on Saturday, because Saturday uh, was a school day, and I remember that the principal of the secondary school told my mother that if I would be absent for three consecutive Sabbaths without medical excuse, I would be expelled from school. And my mother faithfully took me to the family doctor every week. And the doctor was very, very supportive, very helpful. You know what he did? He prepared the most funny medical excuse that you have ever seen. He wrote something to the effect that Sam Bacchiocchi on such and such a Saturday was psychologicamente incapacitato, psychologically incapacitated. My mind was working fine during the week, but when the Sabbath came, my brain snapped out. It went out of order. And the principal accepted it because it was written, you know, by a doctor. It was an official medical excuse. I remember especially the problem I faced with the Catholic priest. Even today, in all the public schools in Italy, the Catholic priest twice a week will teach the student what we call a catechismo catholico, the Catholic catechism. When the priest heard that I was in the class, non-Catholic, protestante, protestante, adventista, adventist, protestant, he told the whole class, ah, Bacchiocchi sitting down there is a protestant heretico, heretical protestant, keep away from him, keep away from him. And that's exactly what they did. Whenever I approached my friend, you know, to strike conversation with them, so stay lontano, Keep away from us. Tu sei un heretico, you are a heretic. Tu sei un judeo, you are a Jew. We don't want to talk to you. That hurt me terribly. You know, when you are a teenager, you want to be accepted by your friends. Isn't it true? And being rejected by my friend, it was very, very painful. I remember very vividly going home many times, heartbroken, crying. Say, Mama, Papa, don't send me to school anymore. Everybody hates me at school. I don't want to go to school anymore. I remember my godly father, dignified, solemn-looking gentleman. He would look me straight into my eyes and say, Samuele, you stand up for what you know to be God's truth. God 
will honor your commitment. And this is the challenge I'd like to pass on to all of us, that if we stand up for what we know to be God's truth, sometimes we may have to suffer ridicule, rejection, persecution, but ultimately the Lord will honor our commitment. And because of all of these problems, these challenges, ridicule, rejection, I started dreaming. Would you believe it? I was only 14, 15 years of age. And I said to myself, if I have to suffer to honor the Savior on the Sabbath, I wanted to be sure that I suffer for biblical truth and not for the sake of a denominational tradition. And I'm pleased to tell you that my dream came true on July 1977 when I stood inside the Vatican Press watching my doctoral dissertation from Sabbath to Sunday rolling off the Vatican Press with their official uh, stem of the Vatican, the papal tiara and the cross key and the official imprimatur. Folks, would you believe it? This is the only book ever published by the Roman Catholic Church carrying the stamp of approval, the imprimatur given by two examiners, the rector of the university and the vicariate of Rome. There's a threefold approval. Do you know why? Because if a problem develops, they can share responsibility. You know, the examiner can say even the president of the university has approved it. They can say even the archbishop of Rome has approved it. And let me tell you, as I mentioned last night, this has been a hot potato for the Roman Catholic Church. They never anticipated so much controversy. Many of the Catholic leaders in Central and South America realized have been fuming about it. You should see some of the letters I received from Catholic leaders in Argentina, Brazil, Venezuela, Uruguay, Costa Rica, Puerto Rico. Some of these Catholic leaders were trying to be inquisitor. They were trying to be investigator. They wanted to find out who directed my dissertation, who gave me the, uh, the imprimatur, how did I receive it. It was, you know, they were doing all of this investigation and I could tell that uh, the trouble was coming. So before, before, I could smell smoke, as you say in English. So before uh, the trouble really broke out fully, I went to Rome and I negotiated buying the copyright. I said to the um, publisher there of the Pontifical Gregorian University, would it be possible for me to compensate you for all what you have invested in time and money in publishing my dissertation so then I can reprint it in America? They calculated the cost. They told me it would be $5,000. I wrote them a check of $5,000, and they gave me the, the copyright, the possibility of reprinting my research without interference. And I'd like to thank God for that. You know, if I hadn't done it, today they would prevent the circulation of my book. So the Lord really gave me the wisdom to do the right things. Now, I'd like to take a moment to thank in a special way my beloved professor, Vincenzo Monachino. He's the man who interviewed me on the day of my admission. He's the man that directed my dissertation. He was a godly man, a man with a high intellectual stature, a man that was committed to, uh, to promote the inquiry into truth rather than to protect the prevailing Catholic viewpoint. He knew that I was a Seventh-day Adventist. He knew that this research could create some problems for him, but God gave him the courage, courage, you know, to lead me, uh, lead me in this in investigation. I want to tell you, however, that not all the professors were like him. Some of the professors told me very openly that I should have never been allowed to study at the Gregoriano. You know, the Gregoriana is the most prestigious Jesuit university in the world, founded by Ignatius of Loyola. The founder of the Jesuit movement is the university that has trained all the popes, cardinals, and bishops of the Roman Catholic Church, even here at Notre Dame. All the professors teaching theology, they all have been trained at the Gregoriana, so it's the brain center of the Catholic Church. And the, some of these professors did not want to see me there. One of them told me one day, we were in Ravenna on a study tour, he said, Sam, you should have never been allowed to be at our university. I was telling him the discovery that I was making, some of the papal decreta which I found, you know, ro revealing the role of the papacy in changing the Sabbath to Sunday. I thought he might be interested about this kind of research. Not at all. I should have never done it. I could tell that I had touched a sensitive nerve because his face became blue, you know. He got very, very upset. And he told me, you know, I know on certain terms, if I'm going to be in the examining commission, I'm going to give you hell, Tidarol Inferno, mamma mia. 
yeah, we don't believe in hell. But one thing we know, that those guys are very well trained. And if they want to boycott the work of a student, they know how to do it. And let me reassure you that the threat of hell was not a comforting thought as I was preparing for the defense of my dissertation, you know. Sometimes I had nightmare. I was dreaming of being there in the defense hall and I was seeing the face of this professor who had threatened me with hell. But the day when I entered the defense hall and I saw that this man who had openly threatened me with hell wasn't there, I said, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I thought I was entering paradise, you know. You know, I also like to thank the Pope himself, Pope Paul VI. He was so gracious to award me a gold medal, beautiful medal. I was showing it to you in the first lecture. In the for, for front side, it shows the picture of the Pope himself. On the back side, it portrays a shepherd uh, carrying a lamb on his shoulder, the flock, the new Jerusalem. He portrays the Pope as the great shepherd of the flock, leading God's people to the city of God. And I received this gold medal for earning the summa cum laude distinction in my research and in my and school work. I view this medal, folks, not as a personal triumph, but as the triumph of truth. The triumph of our mission today to proclaim the good news of the Sabbath to our tension-filled and restless society. Now, some of, my, some of our fellow believers are a bit distressed about the fact that I would receive a gold medal from the Pope. They feel there is something fishy about it. Uh, how could you receive a gold medal for a research that is supportive of the Sabbath? They feel that something doesn't square in their mind. Well, let me tell you, it is not because I'm a Jesuit spy, as these people are trying to insinuate. It is simply because my research proves that the historical Catholic position is absolutely correct. Historically, the Catholic Church has always claimed the responsibility for changing the Sabbath to Sunday. We are going to come back to that in a moment. All what I have done is to prove it. I found a number of papal decrets, uh, you know, showing the theological, social, liturgical method used by the papacy to lead Christians away from Sabbath keeping into Sunday keeping. So basically, my research is very supportive of the papal authority. It shows why, how they did it. Obviously, I do not endorse what they did it because I show that ultimately what they did, you know, by promoting the abandonment of the Sabbath was more motivated by expediency, by hate for the Jews, by the desire to avoid, you know, uh, anti-Sabbath, anti-Jewish legislation rather than by a commitment to the teaching of the Word of God. Now, because of all of this negative reaction I talked about, the Pontifical Gregorian University has taken three measures. Number one, they have removed my book from circulation. They removed it from all their bookstores, from all their library, and now any Catholic institution who wishes to uh, obtain copies of my dissertation, they have to contact me. I was in South Africa, interviewed there in the evening, by the way, at 6 o'clock, just before the evening news. I was interviewed by a very brilliant newscaster. You know, these men do the homework. Usually when I've been interviewed in the United States, they are always very generic questions. But this man read my dissertation, and he thought that he was going to corner me. And he didn't realize that I was very well prepared, and so I blasted him out. I felt sorry for him because all the arguments that he was fabricating were senseless, and I did not hesitate to expose, you know, the, the irrationality. But, you know, among the viewers, there was a bishop of Durban, and he couldn't believe what he was seeing because I showed the medal, I showed the diploma, I showed everything, I told the whole story, and you know what? He got on the phone, and as soon as I got back to America, he said, you know, I've been trying to get your dissertation from the Vatican. They tell me that it's no longer available, that it's out of print, but how is it that you were showing it? How is it that you were offering it? Can I get it from you? Sure, I said. We have just printed 10,000 copies. I can mail them all to you, and I can have another reprint. No, I do not need 10,000 copies. 20 copies will do it. I sent him 20 copies. And this happens all the time here from Notre Dame University 
university, I always receive orders every year for copies of the book that they are using for the early Christian liturgy. So um, I like to thank God for giving me the wisdom to buy the copyright before the book was withdrawn. My professor was told by the general of the Jesuit order, Father Arupe, never to have any more contact with me. That really saddened me because we were good friends. Every time I went to Rome, I always brought him a gift from America, a leather briefcase, a golden pen, a watch. Every year I went to Rome for several years. I always wanted to show my gratitude to my professor for being so gracious with me because we were good friends. I had the responsibility of distributing all the syllabi, collecting all the money, go up with him in the room every day. And I tell you, even during the research, every time I, I found a text or a document which was probative for the Sabbath, I went to talk it, with, talk it over, to discuss it with my professor. He was always willing to receive me. In fact, shall I tell you what, when I went to Rome to visit him, he knew that I would not drink coffee. So he had a little kettle, an he, he, electric kettle, and warmed up some water and gave me mint tea. So while he was drinking, while he was smoking his cigar, I was sipping mint tea, and <laughs> we had a good time together. But then, because of all of this negative reaction from Central and South American countries, prim primarily, he was instructed by the general of the Jesuit order never to have any more contact with me. And so, even when he was dying a year ago, he was there in the critical care unit of the hospital. I begged if I could see my beloved professor for the last time. They told me, you know, that you have been instructed not to contact your professor. Please make no attempt. Otherwise, we will, we will have to remove you forcefully, uh, by force, you know, from the hospital. So this was very sad for me because I enjoyed the fellowship and the interaction with my beloved professor. And lastly, the door of the university was closed. I was the first and the last non-Catholic to be admitted there at the Gregorianum. I would like to thank God for the opportunity that he gave me to be there, for opening the door for me, for being able to conduct this investigation, for being able to publish this research right there. Shall I tell you, many, many Catholic people that have read this book have accepted the Sabbath because because uh, it, officially it's a Catholic publication. It has the stem of the Vatican, the official Catholic imprimatur. People will read about the Sabbath, you know, with all the blessing of their church. You follow me? You know, recently I was invited to the baptism of a Catholic bishop, Giuseppe Fradale. Good Italian name. In fact, he's from Italy, from Toscana, from Tuscany. And he invited me there in Brooklyn, New York, because he said that this research had been instrumental in helping him to accept the Sabbath and join our church. He was baptized on his 62nd birthday. He said, I want to celebrate my physical birth and spiritual rebirth in the same day. Would you be willing to be the guest of honor to my baptism? Because your research was instrumental in helping me to accept the Sabbath. He said, these people can read about the Sabbath with an open mind because after all, they are reading what officially is a Catholic publication. Now, after this introductory remark, I like to discuss with you some of the recent attacks against the Sabbath from the Pope himself, John Paul II, from Catholic and Protestant scholars, and from former Sabbatarian. You know, the Sabbath is being attacked today in a very subtle and deceptive way by the Pope himself. On May 31, 1998, the Pope promulgated the famous pastoral letter Dies Domini, the Lord's Day, where he makes a passionate plea for a recovery of the Sabbath, uh, the, the recovery of Sunday today. Now, this document, which is about 54 page document, is a very deceptive document. You know why? Because on the one hand, the Pope praises the Sabbath in a very eloquent way. He said the Sabbath reveals the sacred architecture of time from perfect creation to complete redemption to uh, ultimate restoration. When I read the first seven pages, you know what I thought? I thought that he may have accepted the Sabbath after reading my two books from Sabbath to Sunday, the Divine Rest. They were given to the Pope directly, personally, by Dr. Beverly Beach from the General Conference on a private audience with the Pope when he was in Rome leading a famine relief 
brief de delegation. You know, this um, uh, Dr. Beach gave to the Pope my two books. We got a letter, a letter of acknowledgement from the private secretary of the Pope saying that the Holy Father was, was studying the, the books of San Bacchiochi with great benefit and uh, interest. I said to myself, I wonder if he has accepted the Sabbath. I was almost ready to go to Rome and extend to the Pope the right hand of fellowship <laughs> into the Seventh day Adventist Church. But then, as I continued to study, my joy turned to sorrow. Why? Because all of a sudden I found what the Pope does. He applies all the biblical reference to the Sabbath to Sunday. He wants to make Sunday the continuation, the embodiment, and the full expression of the Sabbath. Let me read a statement to you so that you know what I'm talking about. Notice what the Pope says. Sunday is the day of rest because it is the day blessed by God, made holy by him, set apart from the other days to be among them the Lord's day. Have you ever read that in your Bible? That God blessed the seventh day, blessed the first day of the week, and uh, that made it holy, set it apart to be the whole, uh, the Lord's day. What is the Pope doing? The Pope is taking these biblical references to the Sabbath and apply them to Sunday. He wants to make Sunday the biblical Sabbath. Now, this is very deceptive because Sunday is not the Sabbath. Moreover, this is not the historical Catholic position. Historically, the Catholic Church has never claimed the Sabbath to be, uh, the Sunday to be the biblical Sabbath. Notice, for example, what Thomas Aquinas, the most influential Catholic theologian, says in the New Law, the observance of the Lord's Day took the place of the observance of the Sabbath, not by virtue of the Sabbath commandment, but by the institution of the church. We, the Catholic Church, did it. And that has been the claim, the historical claim, even when you read the debate between Luther and Professor Eck in 1521, you know, Professor Eck, the papal legate, asked Luther, if you stand by sola scriptura, why do you observe the Sabbath? You know that that is a Catholic institution, which for Luther, that that's not a problem for me. People can come to church any day, as long as they come for one hour to listen to the proclamation of the word of God. So we have no problem to accept, you know, the Catholic institution of Sunday. So it was always historically accepted that Sunday is a Catholic ecclesiastical institution. But what is happening today? Today, you will find that since Vatican II, the Second Vatican Council that was held in Rome almost 40 years ago, there is an attempt to make not only Sunday, but all the Catholic dogmas, all the Catholic beliefs and practices, to make them biblical. In other words, to root them and ground them in the Word of God. What is happening is that while in the past, Catholic appealed to scriptura e traditio, you know, they were the dual authority for defining their beliefs and practice. Today, there is a tendency to give priority to the Bible. The Catholic want to prove, indeed, that their teaching, their practices are biblical, not only uh, traditional. Now, why does the Pope want to make Sunday the biblical Sabbath? You know why? This picture tells you why. It is summertime, Sunday morning, where are the people? They are on the beach. We, were, we noticed that when we were there in, in Italy this last uh, June. The beach were crowded there near Venice where we were with over a million people there sunbathing. But the church was completely empty. There was a, there was a, there was a priest standing outside the church there. He was supposed to celebrate the mass, but there was nobody inside. So he decided to go outside and enjoy some sunshine himself. This is a real problem. This is a real problem. The Pope is very concerned about the crisis of the Lord's Day. In fact, that is why he has promulgated a pastoral letter. That is why practically every Sunday in his homily, he makes an appeal to the faithful to revive the practice of Sunday keeping. But he wants to make Sunday keeping no longer a Catholic ecclesiastical institution, but a biblical institution. He wants to ground and root of Sunday keeping in the Decalogue, in the Sabbath commandment. Why? Because he feels that by so doing, he can put more teeth into Sunday observer. The people will no longer say, well, but that is only a teaching of the church. If it's rooted and grounded in the Decalogue, which is the supreme moral 
what shall I say, document, revelation which has been given to us, he feels that this gives a more compelling authority to the promotion of Sunday. Now, I spent a lot of time examining this document. In fact, if you were to read the first chapter of my book, The Sabbath and the Crossfire, the first 50 pages is entitled um, the <coughs> Pope John Paul II and the Sabbath. I have a whole chapter devoted to that. And let me tell you that the public media has taken notice of this research I received a telephone call from Bill Broadway, the religion editor of Washington Post. He kept me on the phone for two hours. Then he sent FedEx at my house to get all my four Sabbath books. He wanted to have them on his desk by 10 o'clock next morning. And he wrote a good article. By the way, did you see my picture next to the one of the Pope? I mean, good company there, don't you think so? <laughs> and in this article, Bill Broadway says, when is the Lord's Day? Adventist says Pope unfairly promotes Sunday Sabbath. Um, the, he basically supports my contention that Sunday is not the Sabbath. So the attempt of the Pope to promote Sunday as the biblical Sabbath is very deceptive. Now, I'd like to point out that the Pope's attempt to promote Sunday as the biblical Sabbath poses two problems. One is a biblical problem because, as I mentioned a moment ago, Sunday is not the Sabbath. The two days have a different origin, different meaning, different authority, different experience. But secondly, there is also a legal problem because what the Pope is doing, uh, if you read carefully, he is appealing to the international community of nations to promulgate the Sunday legislation in order to facilitate Sunday and the observance. And let me tell you, by the way, that the Pope is having a lot of success, a lot of success. I just reached, last night I received a, a news release from Germany, not from Germany, from England, where some of the games that were, you know, the uh, soccer is very popular in Europe, in, in England, and there was a main soccer game to be played between Ireland and England. It was supposed to be played on Sunday, but because of all of this uh, pressure to restore the sanctity and sacredness of Sunday, they decided to move the game on Saturday. And this has happened in Italy. All the major leagues game now, they are no longer played on Sunday, but on Saturday. And when I was in Holland recently, I was surprised that they have passed some of the most stringent Sunday laws in the country. Not even concerts, not even you know, in entertainment uh, events can be held on a Sunday. That was about January a year ago. If you go to my website, biblicalperspective.com, you can read about all the Sunday laws that are being promoted over there in Europe. Now, what I have proposed to the Pope is that the solution to the crisis of Sunday observance is not legislation, but moral internal renovation. I believe that what the Pope should be doing is to call upon the Christian to remember what they have forgotten, to remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, and help them understand that to remember the Sabbath day is not just a matter of going to church for one hour on Sunday or on Saturday afternoon, because now they can fulfill their Sunday mass obligation on Saturday afternoon, but it's giving priority to God in our thinking, in our living uh, during the 24 hours of the Sabbath. Now, the Sabbath is also being attacked today by Catholic and Protestant scholars. You know, Ellen White speaks about the um, bridging of the gulf, the stretching of the hands across the gulf. I tell you, when you study the Sabbath Sunday question, it's amazing to see how Catholic and Protestant scholars support one another in their attempt to legitimize Sunday keeping as a biblical institution. Now, the most influential book that has been published is... Um, this symposium by seven British and American scholars, which was, this is a, what shall I call it, a common doctoral project of seven British American scholars who worked together at Cambridge University in England. It was sponsored by the Tyndale Bible Fellowship. And uh, this is a very influential book. There are many dissertations, but this is the book which I believe represents the latest and most uh, scholarly attempt to justify Sunday observance. In many ways, this is a response to my dissertation. In fact, there on page 15, they say that without doubt, the work that has stirred up the most interest in the English-speaking world is that of Sam Bakyoke. Remarkably, he wrote his book as a doctoral dissertation at the Pontifical Gregorian University 
and they, they actually speak very, very favorably in many ways. And if you look upon the index of author here in the back of the book, after my name, you will see about 100 page references. It means that they refer to my research about 100 times, sometimes, you know, approvingly, sometimes disapprovingly. But what these people, what these scholars are arguing, they basically try to defend the thesis that Christ terminated at the cross the Old Testament function of the Sabbath by becoming our Sabbath rest. And consequently, New Covenant Christians are to observe Sunday in honor of Christ's resurrection. Now, I find two major flaws. Number one, I find that Christ did not nullify, but clarify the Sabbath. These people would like us to believe that Christ, by his provocatory method of, of Sabbath keeping, was paving the way for the abandonment of the Sabbath in the adoption of Sunday. I find that when you study the whole Sabbath material of the Gospels, for example, you find that Jesus went out of his way to reveal the real divine intent of the Sabbath. There are seven Sabbath healing episodes in the Gospel, and Jesus made very important Sabbath pronouncement. He said that the Sabbath is the day to do good. He said the Sabbath is the day to save. He said the Sabbath is the day to liberate men and women from physical and spiritual bomb. He said that the Sabbath is the day of mercy. He said that the Sabbath was made for our human benefit. None of these pronouncements, folks, suggest that Jesus intended to nullify, but rather he uh, worked hard to clarify the Sabbath, not as rules to obey, but as people to love. Now, the second flaw of this uh, research is that Number one, there is no command in the New Testament of Jesus or of the Apostle regarding a weekly Sunday or annual Easter Sunday celebration of the resurrection. Listen carefully now. We have a command for the, for the Sabbath. We have a command for baptism. We have a command for foot washing. We have a command for the Lord's Supper. If Jesus wanted the day of his resurrection to become a memorial day, don't you think that he would have done something about it? Don't you think so? On the day when he arose, wouldn't he have called the women first and the disciples later and said, come apart, let us celebrate my resurrection. But what did Jesus do? He told to the women to get started on a three-day trip to go to Galilee and tell the disciples that he had risen. That hardly suggests that Jesus wanted to make, you know, the day of his resurrection a memorial day. Now, I don't want you to misunderstand. The day of the, re the, the resurrection of Jesus is very important but is never celebrated liturgically in the New Testament. It's always an existential experience of living by the power of the resurrection. It's interesting to notice that the phrase day of the resurrection is nowhere to be found in the New Testament. In fact, you don't even find it in the early Christian literature. We have to wait until the writing of Eusebius of Caesarea in 325 AD to find the first reference to Sunday as the day of his resurrection. The emphasis of the New Testament is not on the day, but on the power of the resurrection. Paul prays in Philippians 3 that I may know the power of the resurrection. In other words, in the New Testament, the resurrection is an existential reality, not a liturgical practice. Now let me talk for a few moments because my time is running so fast. Mamma mia, I'm always under the restraint of time. Well, that's why it's nice to teach because you have four months or three months at your disposal, but on a weekend seminar, you only have minutes to cover so much. I'd like to discuss with you for a few moments how the Sabbath has been attacked by former Sabbath. This is the first time in the history of Christianity when the Sabbath is being attacked by those who in the past have been the champion of Sabbath keeping. Who are they? Number one, the leaders of the Worldwide Church of God. On January 1995, their president, Pastor General Joseph Tekachi Jr., with the help of two associates, prepared a 22-page document on the Sabbath where he declared the Sabbath to be a Jewish Old Testament institution uh, given to the Jews, nailed to the cross no longer binding upon us Christians today. And that document has had a devastating effect on the worldwide Church of God. A church of 200,000 members now is left with less than 30,000 members. And I met with these people. They have invited me 25 times across the United States. They invited me to Australia for a Sabbath conference. You should, you should see how these people were agonizing. One man told me he had flown 2,000 miles from, from air 
to seek me, to attend this conference. He said, you know, I've been a seven-day Sabbath keeper for 30 years. I would have never dreamed that I would have to fly across Australia to attend the Sabbath conference and pay $50 of registration, not for me, but for the cost of the convention center. But he said, when your faith is shaken and your family is breaking up because his wife wanted to stay with the worldwide and uh, adopt the Sunday observance, he wasn't prepared to give up the Sabbath. He said, you seek for all the help that you can get. You know, we are told that the Sabbath is going to become a testing truth in this final hour of world history. And for some people, indeed, it is a testing truth. But you know, folks, I'm sad to report to you this afternoon that even within our own Adventist church, in the last five, six years, we have lost about 50 pastors and Bible teachers who have written books and articles, cassettes, videos against the Sabbath. The most influential document is The Sabbath in Crisis by Dale Ratzloff. He was a Bible teacher for nine years at Monterey Bay Academy, and then he served as a pastor there for seven years in Southern California. Um, this book has been very influential. Now they also produce a magazine. I receive it regularly. They call it the Proclamation Magazine, a uh, magazine where he attacks not only the Sabbath, but also other fundamental Adventists believe. When I spoke with him the last time, I suggested that he should change the name from procla Proclamation to Provocation. Provocation, because this is the magazine by which he tried to provoke the Seventh-day Adventists to anger. Now, I was invited to debate him by a very popular radio station in St. Louis, Missouri. He had given three talks against the Sabbath, and so somebody suggested my name as one who could uh, respond. So they called me and they asked me if I would be willing to debate him, because three other pastors locally had got cold feet the last minute, and they would not uh, consider the invitation. I said, no problem with me, absolutely no problem. I up in Rome. I had to fight and stand up for my faith, you know, every day. No problem. We had a very animated discussion for one hour. I gave him a lot of punches. I was really hoping to give him the knockout, but they wouldn't give me the time to finish the job. They would only give me one minute. What can you do in one minute? I've been trained by Jesuits. They taught me to overkill, not to live half dead. You follow me? And in one minute, you cannot do the overkilling. <laughs> and so I proposed to him. I said, Dale, if you are very serious about it, why don't we do this? I'm going to examine each one of the 12 chapters. I post my analysis, show the, 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 the flaws in your methodology and conclusion. Then you can respond on an equal time basis. And you know what? Within three weeks, 10,000 people signed up for the debate. And that is how the anti-mission newsletter began. What is the fundamental problem with Dale Ratzlaff? The problem with him and his associate, and there are quite a number of people in our church who have followed, embraced in this new covenant theology. Just to give an example, there in near the general conference in, uh, in Damascus, Maryland, we had this Damascus uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church with over 500 members. And the pastor there, Dr. Richard Frederick, a graduate of Andrews University with a doctorate in religious education, embraced this new covenant theology. He was very charismatic, eloquent. He pulled away with him almost 500 members. And even today, when I called the other day, they told me they only have 70, 80 members, less, uh, less than 100 members in a church that had almost 600 members. 560 was the membership, to be exact. And I could tell you story after story. In Colorado, in Oregon, there was a very beautiful church there in Oregon, Milwaukee, with about 700, 800 members. I had a weekend seminar. They have sold the church now because practically all the Adventists have disappeared. So we are facing a challenge. We have lost about 50,000 members we don't hear about it because obviously our leaders are not too excited to share this sad news. But this is why we had the Sabbath school quarterly on the covenant. You remember, when was it? Just two, three quarters ago, we had a whole series of lesson on the covenant because this is indeed the problem we are facing today. Now, even in the Sunday magazine, would you believe it? An Adventist pastor contributed an article. This is the official publication of the Lord's Day Alliance of the United States. And in this article, he says, why the Lord's Day matters to me. And he begins by saying, as a former Seventh-day Adventist, observance of the Seventh-day Sabbath was very important to me. And then he gives four reasons why he has rejected the Sabbath. And we like to take a moment to look at this New Covenant theology. I have to do it very quickly because the time left is very limited. This New Covenant theology emphasizes the distinction between the Old 
covenant package of laws and the new covenant principle of love. And they claim that the Sabbath is part of this old covenant package of law that was nailed to the cross. And consequently, new covenant Christians are to observe the Sabbath not literally by resting on the seventh day, but spiritually by experiencing the rest of salvation every day. May I mention quickly four major flaws of the new covenant theology. First of all, it creates an arbitrary distinction between the old and new covenant. You know, when you look it carefully in the Bible, you will find that new covenant is already given in the Old Testament. And it consists not in the replacement of a package of law with principle of love, but in the internalization of God's law. Do you remember what the prophet Jeremiah says? Jeremiah 31, 33, this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel. I will put my law within them. I will write them upon their heart. That is the new covenant, observing God's law uh, out of a loving heart. You know, in the Bible, law is love. Jesus says, if you love me, you keep my commandment. The second flaw of this new covenant theology is the failure to recognize that the covenant in the Bible is God's commitment to save his people. And God has only one plan of salvation. These people would like us to believe that in the Old Testament, God offers salvation by works, works of the law. In the New Testament, he offers salvation by grace. You know, uh, the, the idea is that God tried works. When he found that works don't work, then he changed the method, simplified, and offered salvation by grace. If that was true, my friends, then God learned by mistakes, you know. But in our Bible, God is the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. When Moses went up to the mountain to receive the Decalogue, the two table of stone, didn't he also receive the blueprint of the tabernacle, which revealed God's provision of grace? Salvation has always been a divine gift of grace. Isn't it true? In the Old Testament, this, uh, uh, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus was accepted typologically through the sacrificial system. In the New Testament, it is accepted realistically through baptism the Lord's Supper. A third flaw of the New Covenant theology that it ignores the cosmic sweep of the Sabbath. You know, the Sabbath embraces perfect creation, complete redemption, constant intercession, final restoration. These are the fundamental meaning, the good news of the Sabbath, which I explore in my red, green book, Divine Rest. Perfect creation, complete redemption, and final restoration. In other words, the Sabbath goes from creation to final restoration. And what is interesting, if you look at the book of Hebrews, you find that the author writes to Hebrew-minded Christian, and he tries to explain to them what? that the sanctuary, the Levitical ministry, the sacrificial system are obsolete, done away, abolished, uh, finished. But when it comes to the Sabbath, what does he say? A uh, Sabbath keeping remains for the people of God. Now I have good news for you. You know, historically, the Sabbatismus in Hebrew 4.9 has always been interpreted, you know, spiritually, symbolically, said that this does not necessarily refer to seven-day Sabbath keeping, but to the spiritual ex experience of salvation. But I have good news for you. This major symposium recently published has a whole chapter by Professor Lincoln from London who made a study of Sabbatismus. He found what I did not succeed to find. I was looking for the use of Sabbatismus in extra biblical literature, and I did not succeed. You are talking about 500 volumes of patristic literature, and looking for a word in, in, in such a collection of works is like looking for the needle in the haystack. But I have good news for you. This man found several uses, five of them, in both Christian and secular literature. And in every instance, Sabbatismus is what? Notice what he writes, Professor Lincoln. In each of these places, the term denotes the observance uh, or celebration of the Sabbath. Now, any informed scholars or church leaders will be able to verify that Sabbatismus in Hebrew 4.9 is the technical term for the celebration of the Sabbath. But what is beautiful in Hebrew, the author did not have to persuade this Hebrew-minded Christian to observe the Sabbath because they were already observing it. They were even attending the temple and participating in the sacrificial system. What they needed to understand was the meaning of the act of resting. 
resting. And if you study carefully Hebrews chapter 4, the author explained that the act of resting was a faith response. We who have believed enter into God's rest. Hebrews 4.10, we cease from our work in order to enter into God's rest. This is a beautiful explanation of the meaning of the Sabbath that is found nowhere else in the scripture. It's only in Hebrew where we understand that the act of resting on the Sabbath has a profound spiritual meaning. It's our faith loving response to our Savior. We stop our work in order to allow our Savior to work in us. The Sabbath remains. Why? Because the Sabbath points to the rest and peace that awaits the people of God in the world to come. The fourth flaw of this New Covenant theology is that it ignores that it's through the physical Sabbath rest that we apprehend, conceptualize, experience the reality of the spiritual rest of salvation. I think this is something that we need to understand, that God often uses physical realities to help us understand spiritual truth. Why do we have the bread and wine in the Lord's Supper. Because through these two elements, which were non-sacrificial elements of the Jewish Passover, which Christ chose, we are able to conceptualize, to appropriate the reality of the broken body, of the spilled blood for our salvation. Why do we have water in baptism? Why don't we dry clean people into the church? <laughs> because there is a spiritual meaning through the, by being immersed into the physical water, we can conceptualize and experience dying to a life of sin and being risen in a new life with Christ. Are you with me? What is the point I'm trying to make? We sometimes need the physical to apprehend the spiritual. And this is true of the Sabbath. Why? Is God inviting us to rest on the seventh day? It's not just for personal relaxation. If that was the case, we don't need the Sabbath anymore. This is what Professor Willie Rort of argued from Switzerland. When I was over there recently, I visited with him in Basel. You know, he wrote one of the major doctoral dissertations on this subject. And his argument is that the Sabbath was good for the Jews because they were living in a very suppressed society where people had no human rights, no civil rights. They had to work seven day on seven. So the Sabbath was the magna carta of human rights in those kind of agricultural society. But the, f the, the problem with that kind of reasoning is the favor to recognize the theological orientation of the Sabbath. We don't rest unto ourselves. We rest unto the Lord. Are you with me? We stop our work because we want to allow the Lord to work in us more fully and more freely. This is the message of the book of Hebrews 4.10. We cease from our work in order to enter into God's rest. I wish when we had the Sabbath school on Hebrew that this whole message of the Sabbath in Hebrew was brought out, but it was left out altogether, unfortunately. So the physical Sabbath rest makes us receptive, responsive to the working of God. In conclusion, fellow believers and friends, we have seen that the Sabbath is being attacked today more than ever before. I believe that this reminds us that we are living in the very end of time when this end time showdown will take place. The three angel messages reminds us that the final conflict is going to be over worship. If you look at the three angel message, worship God, Babylon, the center of all worship is fallen, come out of her, my people. The whole issue is the issue of worship. And this is an issue which has been the main conflict throughout human history. When we study, for example, this whole uh, false worship, you know, the worship of the golden calf, of the golden image, of Balaam, of images of Saint Madonna, of Buddha, of the sacred stone of the cabal by the Muslim. And today there is this whole worship, they call it worship renewal. I would rather say that it's a kind of a worship fanaticism where people want to experience, you know, physical uh, excitement. You know, we live in an age of excitement, of drugs of alcohol, and people also want to use religion as a kind of a drug. They want to be able, you know, to feel this excitement. That's why the charismatic Pentecostal movement is the fast-growing church, because they give to the people what they want. 
the physical stimulation that many people are looking for. And you know, folks, even in our own church, we are facing some problem today. I just got a report from a very well informed leading pastor in Australia. I will be sharing it in a week time in my newsletter about the whole Pentecostalist charismatic movement over there. And it's taking place also in this country. You know, recently I spoke in a church there in uh, near Los Angeles where I couldn't believe it. People were went really crazy. You know, I, I've been in many churches where, you know, there are these rock bands and so forth. But in this place, man, Mia. The, everything was blasting and the, the people got so excited that got out of the pew and started swinging and dancing and shouting and oh my eardrums were aching and I could almost, I was almost ready to walk out but I had to preach, I had no choice, I had to stick around but you know the pastor told me afterwards and the pastor was a very calm preacher it was not one of those fiery preachers, you know, very calm poised gentlemen, you know. And I said, Pastor, how do you cope with it? Well, he said, you know, son, I told him to call me son. Son, do you know what? I need to give the kind of release to the people. Some of them come to church so frustrated that they need the physical release. So after they have shouted for half an hour, 45 minutes, then when I start preaching, they are calm. Some of them fall asleep. In fact, as soon as I began preaching, half of them fell asleep. And then I could preach peacefully without any interruption. You follow me? There was no more shouting because they had exhausted their energy. But let's remember that this is also part of the manifestation of false worship in this final hour of world history. This is why the Sabbath message is a timely message because it calls us to worship not creature, not emotionalist, not physical excitement, but to worship the one who made the heaven and the earth. And in closing, my fervent hope and prayer that the Sabbath may truly become for us the day when we worship God in spirit and in truth. The Sabbath may become the day when we express to our Lord and to our God our love, our reverence, and our commitment. This is my prayer for each one of us tonight. Let us pray. Thank you, O God, for this opportunity given us this afternoon to be reminded of the latest attacks against the holy day. We are reminded that we live at the very end of time when thy wor the worship of thee, O God, will be attacked in many different ways. And we thank you that through the Sabbath day, we are given the opportunity to understand and experience the true worship in spirit and truth. May the Sabbath become for each one of us the badge of our loyalty, of our commitment to thee. May the Sabbath become the day when we experience in a special way thy presence, thy peace, and thy rest in our lives. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. In the previous presentation,